What's going on, everybody? It is that time again. It's the Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 73, on this Monday, April 8th, 2024. Josh Calloway, James E. Jackson, Tom Green with you on a Monday. The spring game is less than two weeks away. We have a few spring camp things we want to get into on the program today, of course, as we're kind of getting to the tail end of spring camp. Just a handful of practices left. We talked to Brent Venables last week. We saw practice again. We'll recap everything that's happened between now and then. We'll also hit on some basketball stuff. Another big star maybe on the way out for OU basketball. We'll talk about that. And uh, a bit of a tough weekend for both OU softball and baseball. Mm. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit on the tail end of the show as well. But let's start with spring camp, guys. Like I said, we're at the tail end here. Um, the spring game is next Saturday, so we have less than two weeks. I think there's like five or six practices left. If you count the spring game, I think six mm -hmm. uh, practices left. So we're at the tail end of this thing. We were at practice last week. We got to talk to Brent Venables um, afterward for a little bit. The big news, though, that we want to start before we get anything with, from Venables or anything was that Troy Everett got hurt. So this happened at the tail end of practice last Monday, actually. Um, we didn't know the severity of it. You know, Colin and I didn't really get into it on the show that we in, he and I did last week. We now know Brent Venables talked about it. he's going to be out the rest of spring, which wasn't a shock when we were out there on Wednesday. Tom and I both were like, yeah, that guy – he had a brace on his knee. It wasn't bent. It didn't look great, but you never, you never know. But Brent Venable says he's going to be out the rest of fall or the rest of spring and a lot of the fall. They're hoping he can be back by the end of fall camp. I guess put this into context, guys, for – I mean, this was probably your starting center. Um, will he still be? You know, who who's the beneficiary of this? Not the you want guys to get hurt, but for the other guys in the team that now will need to step up. What are kind of the ripple effects – that happens from this injury that you just hate. I mean, this is something that is a coach's nightmare, having a guy who's probably going to start for you go down in spring camp. Where do you go from here if you're Oklahoma? Yeah, I mean, first off, it's, it's a tough blow. Um, the good news is that he should be back, you know, like you said, toward the end of fall camp. Sure. Whether he'll be ready for the season opener is another question, um, just because, right. you know, how long is it going to take him to get reacclimated, get comfortable with that and all that stuff. But it's tough when you look at everything that this offensive line already lost from last season how many guys who were either everyday starters or started multiple games. And he's one of only two guys back this season who started games last year. It's him and Jacob Sexton. And you were expecting him to step in there and take over for Andrew Raymond center. And he'd been, you know, when we were out there, he was the one running with the first team offense uh, in practices. And it's a tough blow. Um, you know, they have a few options left, um, but nobody with a, extensive in-game experience like Troy had not just last season at Oklahoma, but from his time at Appalachian State when he played sure. center too. You know, Josh Bates is going to be the next guy up, but he played four snaps as a freshman last year, and those were in the season opener at the very end of a blowout against Arkansas State. You know, Gary and Hatch is another mm -hmm. option coming from Austin. He's only got 30 career snaps at center, like in-game experience at least. But he's a guy that can play any of those three interior positions. And then you have Josh Isosa, you know, a true freshman who's obviously never played at the college level. So it's it's a tough blow. But, you know, we've heard good things about Josh Bates leading into the spring. And now he's going to have an opportunity to kind of show what he can do and show what his growth has been from, you know, year one to year two. Yeah, I know. For those that are kind of like wondering why we're talking about this now, we learned about this the same time everybody else did, right? At Brent Venables Presser, I got it up on the on the thread. Tom got a story up ASAP, like completely right afterwards. So it's it's been covered. The news has been there. Not so, so nobody thinks we're just now getting the news. That's not the case here. But it's good to actually be able to talk about it and give our opinions on it because, as Tom mentioned, when you go back and actually read about everything that transpired before this, learning about the impact that this can have on this offensive line because. That was the question mark. That, that felt like that was the biggest question mark getting into this season was where this OU offensive line was going to be. And so losing your center, which is usually a corner piece of your offensive line at this point in the season, I mean, I know it's the offseason, but at this point in time where you're trying to gel everybody together, yeah. it's crucial. I mean, it, it is crucial. It is crucial. So now he has to kind of be the leader from the sideline, be the, be the guy that's thinking from the sideline and help those guys out. Now, we, we heard about Josh Bates. He's done a pretty good job so far. So, so we've heard. I mean, but, you know, you, you, it, replacing at this point in the season, replacing this right two weeks before the spring game and things like that, it's going to be it's going to be a curve here. It's going to be a curve and you still got to get that offensive line right. And so not having anybody, everybody out there at the right time is it's going to be it's going to be different. It's going to be a little bit difficult. I think that should be pointed out here. Yeah, I think the obvious um, 
it puts us uh, probably some emphasis on the post spring portal window um, to maybe go find another guy, another another option you could play center for the reasons that Tom said. There's just not that many guys on the team that have experience at center. It's kind of I don't know if we know it, but it's more obviously apparent now. Now that you just lost the guy who's probably going to start for you, how 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 much they're lacking in that area right now. So yeah, we've heard great things about Josh Bates. I do think. That Gary and Hatch is sliding over, and then maybe a Heath Ozida, who we've talked about before, has had a great camp, maybe kind of filling one of those guard roles if Hatch moves over, could be a viable option. But, yeah, I think, you know, getting into the portal is probably most key. And, again, like we said, we want to stress that it does sound like Troy Everett, there's a decent chance he could be back by week one healthy. But, I mean, you're talking about trying to gel an entire offensive line together, and the guy's missing more than half a spring ball. And mm-hmm. the lion share of fall camp, that's hard to just be like, all right, now go in there and plug right in and, and go. You know what I mean? So yeah. it'll be a storyline we'll have to keep up with, obviously, through spring and into the post-portal window. And then we'll still be talking about this in the fall. And that'll be an update whenever we August rolls around and Brent Venables does that, you know, um, kick off the fall camp press conference. It'd be a question then. Where is Troy Everett? Uh, is he back now? Because that's a huge, that's a huge mm-hmm. question mark right now. And uh, like we said, we beat the offensive line storyline to death. But it's because yeah. it's been the biggest talking point, yeah. and it just got even mur- murkier, which is not not what you want, uh, obviously. Yeah, I, I think this one, you know, of all the positions on the offensive line to have someone get hurt, obviously, you know, there's a lot of emphasis always put on left tackle when you have a right-handed quarterback as, you know, the guy protecting his blind side. Mm-hmm. But the center is the guy that's touching the ball, the only guy on the field that's touching the ball every single play, like no matter what. Mm-hmm. And to lose your most experienced guy – uh, at that spot is tough. Um, again, I mean, we'll see how quickly he can return, whether you know he'll be back for you know the opening week or not. But it, it, it's just tough when you have so many new pieces that you're trying to integrate uh, into this one unit. It's just you know adding a level of difficulty and another layer to what Bill Beatenbow has to accomplish this off season. Mm-hmm. I have no, I have no doubts so he can just plug and play him. I mean, himself, he has the skill set to play the position. It's, it's as we've talked about, it's the chemistry. How 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 are the guys going to gel together? That's the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll keep an eye on that. Obviously, that's going to be uh, we are supposed to have another open practice window on Wednesday of this week. Mm-hmm. So keep an eye out for uh, you know highlight video stuff like that whenever we get there. But we'll keep an eye on you know. Obviously, it sounds like Bates is probably going to be the next guy up for now at least. But um, like Tom said, Brent Venables mentioned Josh Isosa by name, uh, who's obviously an early enrollee. I mean, it's not a guy you want to toss to the SEC if he came to it, but he's a guy that Brent Venables brought up as another option, and Hatchet can move over. So we'll just keep an eye on it. Uh, he's a big guy. Camp. He's he a big guy. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, I've and covered the, him. He's a big guy. And the other thing is that Gary Hatchet hasn't really practiced much so far this spring. No, he's, he's, been, yeah, he's too, not. still recovering mm-hmm. from that foot injury. So your your options are very limited, and it's like this is Josh Bates' opportunity to – you know, show what he's made of and, you know, seize that opportunity in front of him. Mm-hmm. So pivoting right off that, sticking with spring camp, you know, they had a scrimmage last Thursday. I got a few, just a, a couple of notes up for our VIP subscribers uh, afterward. I continue to hear, and this has been a, a kind of a theme, and it's not a surprise in the slightest. Most people could have made this guess that it sounds like right now the defense is pretty far ahead of the offense uh, right now, which is not a shock. I mean, it's just common sense, frankly. I mean, the defense is bringing back a lot of guys. The offense mm-hmm. is not as a new quarterback and the offensive line we just talked about. Um, but defensively, they're a lot further along in their install, <laughs> it sounds like, than the offense is. Um, and they've scrimmaged a couple times. Now it's gotten better. The first scrimmage was like, uh, based off what I told them, again, they're not open to the media, so it's just going off what we've been told and you know what I've heard. But it sounds like the defense kind of kind of was whipping the offense a little bit. The first scrimmage, the second scrimmage was a little better. It's a little more of an equal kind of give and take battle. But it sounds like defense is certainly leading the offense right now, Tom. This is not a surprise, you know, and we've talked about this, um, you know, the Zach Alley preventable being able to be a little more hands off and kind of move around. This is not a shock, um, but it sounds like right now defense is doing everything you want. Offense is still trying to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, like, like you said, that's kind of what you expect this time of year. The defense is almost always going to be ahead of the offense, but especially when you consider that. You know, you have a new offensive coordinator, new starting quarterback, new offensive line, working in some new guys at skill, skill positions. It's a lot to, you know, get up to speed in just a couple of weeks. But also, like, it's very clear in speaking with Brent Venables that he is very pleased with the progress and continued development of this defense, both in terms of the leadership that they have, you know, basically at every level um, of that defense and the, the experience. 
look, look at who they're bringing back. Um, you know, there's obviously a little bit of a question mark at defensive tackle after Jacob Lacey had to retire. You know, that's probably your least experienced spot, so to speak. But you still have a six-year senior, Dejon Terry, who played a lot of snaps last season. You have a junior in Brayson Halden, who's played his share of snaps too. But every level of this defense, every position, you have experience and not not just guys who've played a lot of college football, but guys who have been in this system for multiple years. Um, so it, it, it's it's just clear that Brent Venables feels like, you know, they made obvious growth from year one to year two, and he feels like they can build on that even more going into year three. And I think part of that is also Zach Alley coming in. Yeah. Like you said, it, it his familiarity with Brent Venables and just their comfort level with each other I mean, we've heard it so many times that, you know, Zach Alley is a Brent Venables clone. He's Brent Venables light. He's, you know, he's his disciple, his protege, what mentee, mentor relationship, whatever you want to call it. We're kind of seeing that play out in practice because Brent Venables has an inherent level of trust there. Um, you know, it looks like Zach Alley has a lot more freedom with the linebackers. Mm-hmm. Let's Brent Venables, you know, bounce around a little bit more, do some different things. And ultimately, I think that's going to help this defense in the long run. Also, because you have a guy that, you know, he understands how Brenton Venables wants to teach this, but he doesn't necessarily, you know, approach it with the players the same way. We've heard we've heard a lot of guys say that he's a little bit more relatable. He makes things simpler for them when Brenton Venables might be yelling at them. Zach Alley will get into the the why behind it instead of the how. And once you know the why, the how just becomes you know second nature for these guys. Mm-hmm. My the times have changed at Oklahoma. It's 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 crazy that the defense is the the main factor now, and I, I think this is the I think this is the better route here because now you got a quarterback who's who's so young and, and trying to learn everything. You got him going against these experienced guys that when you look at the first half of the season when they were undefeated seven and zero when everybody was healthy, it was one of the best defenses in the country. I mean, it's just like you get a guy like that playing against that already because you know the SEC is going to be difficult, but having to go against that every single practice. It can only be beneficial, and it, mm-hmm. it works for everybody, not just quarterback. All those guys, the offensive line that we're talking about, all those guys, it's going to be beneficial. So I actually like that the defense is better at this point in time because I think it helps everybody. It helps everybody in this situation. Yeah, I think if you had told all you fans five years ago, you know, defense is, is kind of whipping the offense right now in spring camp, you'd be like, oh, no, what happened? to Did Jalen Hurts get hurt? Did, did Kyler Murray get hurt? It would, be a, bad, What's going on? it would be a bad sign if it was yeah, the same defense. Um, for sure. And uh, so not not a shocker there. And mm-hmm. uh, another note I mentioned, um, and we've talked about it a little bit here and there, continue to hear really good stuff about Michael Hawkins. Um, he's having a great camp. Um, you know, it, it's I still I still um, would imagine, and I'd be surprised if Casey Thompson wasn't the backup when the time came. But mm-hmm. Thompson's been hurt, right? We haven't seen him do much of anything in, in camp. He's very limited right now, still coming off that injury from, from last year's last season at, at FAU. Um, and Michael Hawkins just continue. I mean, every time I talk to anybody around the team, um, it's just like, this kid is good. Uh, he, he, you know, he's passing every test so far. And it's his first spring, obviously. But he, right now, there's a belief that, you know, looking down the ropes, I think maybe if you had asked people a year ago, you know, will Michael Hawkins ever really get a chance to be the guy? It would, you would have gotten mixed responses because it's going to be Jackson all for the next couple of years at least. And then Kevin Sperry is going to be around. And the thought was they're just going to hand it off to Kevin Sperry. Michael Hawkins might just kind of fit into that wrinkle and never really get an opportunity. That belief has really gone away, I, I think, over the last few weeks. And that Michael Hawkins is is impressing enough. I mean, we're talking about him maybe being a candidate for the backup job. Probably going to go Casey Thompson. But it's at least a conversation right now. And Michael Hawkins being a guy down the road. So that's another big thing that's jumped out to me is, like, every time I talk to anybody about – whether it's a practice, a scrimmage, anything, it seems like his name always comes up. It always comes up. So shout out Michael Hawkins, I guess, putting together a nice little camp right now. And I know, Tom, you did a stock risers for our VIP, and he was on it because he, he's been a guy that he's, having, he's doing everything you can hope for. He's stepped right in, and he has been impressive. When we've been out there, he has been impressive. I mean, his, his arm talent, the zip he has on the ball, it looks a little bit different than, than other guys. He's, he's having himself a nice camp right now. He's got reasons for fans to be excited. Yeah, he's another one of those guys that he's just taking advantage of this opportunity yeah. that's in front of him. Right. Because you know, if Casey Thompson was came in fully healthy, we might not be talking about Michael Hawkins like we are right now. Um, you know, I'm sure he would still 
be out there impressing, but he wouldn't be getting these second team reps necessarily. Um, and I still think KC Thompson is, like you said, the favorite to be the backup guy, especially you know, if you need someone in a pinch, you know, you're throwing in the guy that's played 30 something career games and has started at, you know, multiple big time programs. Um, but you like what you see early on here from Michael Hawkins and feel really good about what it portends toward his future. I think I think he's one of those guys that, you know, already has the skill set and the tool set to, to be good in college. But he just has to learn the speed of the game and you know the X's and O's more more clearly, and that and just just getting to this level and, and being able to you know deal with all of that. And I think if he gets all that down, he would be a really really good college quarterback. I, I really do. So I think this is where he's at. Any other things from spring camp you guys want to bring up? Obviously, it's been uh, a little while. We we talked to Brent Venables last Wednesday. They're practicing again today. It's not open or anything. But then Wednesday it's gonna be open again. We're supposed to get more players and stuff afterward. Um, Anything else, though, before we, we flip over some other stuff? Just want to make sure. Um, I mean, an, an, another guy that we just continue to hear good things about is also falls in that category of taking advantage of this opportunity is Heath Ozaida. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean, w w with, with Geary and Hatchet, uh, you know, limited, you know, it's been Ozaida that's been getting those reps at, uh, what is it, left guard or right guard? I'm Left guard, I yeah, believe. Yeah, at right yeah, guard. Yeah, at right guard. Right. I, I, I was just trying to picture it in my head. But, yeah, no, he, he's taking advantage of those reps, and we've heard just, like, great things about, uh, you know, just the aggressiveness that he plays with. And I know they were really high on him, you know, entering fall camp last year. Uh, you know, Brent Venable said that's a guy that, you know, he, he's going to be a good one for them. So to see him continue to develop and now kind of, hey, when Gary and Hatchet comes back, if he's not playing at center – uh, where they might need him, he does either might be pushing for this starting job come fall camp. Hmm. Yeah, no, I like I said, there's a he's been one of the, he, he's giving you more flexibility with the whole center situation, mm -hmm. kind of like we were talking about earlier. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess I will go ahead and throw in there. I want to make sure I got it right. If it was 57 or 58 yarder for for Keltner, 57, 57 yard for Tyler Keltner, I was told uh, in the in the uh, scrimmage last week. Nice. Make Lee fans feel a little better about the situation yeah. there at kicker. So we've talked about that before. Tyler Keltner from Florida State's been been impressive. Um, so yeah, he continues, I think, to lead that competition right now. So that'd be one of the last little little piece there. So yeah, tenth practice of spring is today. Um, and so they have a couple more this week, and then a couple more next week, and then the spring game is next Saturday. Uh, we'll all be getting down there to Norman twelve days from now. We have to see all these guys in a simulated game atmosphere. Um, doesn't give you all the, you know, answers, but it helps a little bit uh, to get to see that. And so we'll look forward to that and we'll preview that in full uh, next Monday or Tuesday. That'll kind of be our final, just what are we watching for going to the spring game uh, before we get there next Saturday. As far as flipping over some other sports, because we got a, a lot going on. Jalen Moore, uh, we're talking about the basketball team, hit the NBA draft. Uh, he entered his name uh, last week. Now we did the show I did with Colin last week, Friday. We talked about JV McCollum entering the portal. We talked about some of the guys they've been chasing, guys that we talked about on the sh on with you guys before, you know, Padula and, and Overton, you know, guys we talked about. I mentioned then that I think that they were done losing guys, and I meant that in the context of guys hopping in the portal. I didn't really take into account this. Uh, Jalen Moore entering his name into the draft. Now, he can still come back. That's the way the NBA is structured. You don't hire an agent. You just go through the process. You can even go through the combine, right? And, mm -hmm. and you can... Mm -hmm get feedback and kind of know where you stand and then still come back to school. So that's not off the table at all. Different. Anymore. A lot different. Yeah. I still think it's very possible that it could happen, but obviously Tom, um, you need Jalen Moore. Uh, this is scary. If you're an OU fan, he's not portaling. He's not like he's leaving you high and dry. He hasn't ruled out a return, but it's now on the table, right? That he could also not be back. And then you'd have a whopping one guy who actually played last year back and that'd be Sam Godwin. So this is a huge storyline to watch, uh, obviously moving forward of what happens uh, here, obviously. Could be big. Yeah, at, at this point, it's not something I would sweat too much about if I'm an Oklahoma sure. fan. I, I think it's just a smart move by Jalen Moore at this point. You know, he's doing his due diligence. Yeah, he's a guy at this like right now. I would still expect him to be back for his senior season, but I've seen so many times uh, just covering other programs, especially at Auburn, where you have guys who have pro potential but aren't there yet, 
And the coach will encourage them to declare for the draft and go through this process because it's a good way to get feedback. It's a good way to see, you know, where you stack up, you know, learn from teams and, you know, player personnel where you need to improve to be able to take that next step to get into the league. And, you know, he's got, you know, almost a month and a half, a little bit more than a month and a half before he has to uh, withdraw from the draft. Um, to be able to maintain his eligibility. And like I said, at this point, I'd expect him to be back. I just think it's a smart move for him to, you know, figure out what he needs to do to get to where he wants to be. Um, yeah. You know, there's always the off chance that, you know, he gets a combine invite and he just absolutely lights it up there and impresses teams with his athleticism and gets a better grade than, you know, he would anticipate. But, you know, if he's a guy that, you know, he's going to, find out he might be like a late second rounder or an undrafted guy who would have to, you know, either find a way to the G league or go overseas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd imagine he'd be back here and, you know, have a chance to improve his stock uh, one more season because, you know, he wasn't a guy that we always talked about with this team, but he was one of their better all around players all season. Most I mean, he averaged, he averaged yeah. 11.2 points per game, led the team with 6.7 rebounds, was one of the best rebounders in the Big 12. And just in terms of rebounding rate, I think it was like 15.8% overall um, of total rebounding opportunities that he corralled. He was, you know, pound for pound, Oklahoma was best defender when he was on the court. You know, he had, he had the mm -hmm. second best defensive rating on the team, and it was just like a fraction behind uh, Otega away for the best one. Um, I think it was like 98 points per 100 possessions allowed when he was on the court. So, I mean, the, the talent is there, the athleticism is there, but he's a guy who's still, you know, a little bit rough around the edges and needs to improve his game. And I think he'll uh, benefit from coming back for his senior season. It was a pleasure uh, to, to cover and, 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 Watch Jalen Moore play this year. You know he was he was great to deal with. You know media and stuff like that. Um, you know, I talked about this before. I mean, what Jalen Moore lacked in skill, you know, and, and things like that, he made up for in just desire and then his athleticism because he is an athletic freak. I mean, he can jump out of the gym and he's a huge guy. I mean, he he is a guy that I could see an NBA team looking at and being like, I can make that guy into something. Like I, so we'll see. You know, it's it's a, a huge swing moment for, for OU going into next year because, you know, I talked about this again with Colin last week on the Friday show. Right now, it's not a complete restart. It's like an 80% restart. If you lose Jalen Moore, you're, you're like at like 90% restart. Like you're basically starting over again. Um, you're pretty much starting over now. But you have a couple of pieces. When you talk about Moore, Godwin, you know, it's a couple of starters. And then Cooper and Northweather. You have some – some kind of building blocks there when you add to the portal and you can feel good about it, losing more would really would sting. And it's not, you know, earth shattering. That's the difference between them being awful or great, but it would, it would sting. So we'll see. And we'll keep an eye on it. Like Tom said, it's not exactly a accelerated thing. He has time. Um, the draft is a ways off. So he has time to make this decision in full and we'll keep an eye on it. Um, if he makes a, a call publicly one way or another, uh, as far as staying or going, and uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on our VIP message boards if we hear anything and uh, all that good stuff with Jalen Moore. The portal continues to we're, – we're still waiting on that first down of the fall as well for Oklahoma. They're still chasing some guys. We'll keep you updated on that, uh, obviously, as well. Shifting over to some diamond sports. It's a huge weekend for both softball and baseball. We haven't talked a ton of diamond sports yet. That will ramp up more on the show coming up. Obviously, as we get into the post-spring football, we get into May and the postseason run for both those sports. So that's going to come more of a norm uh, on the show here as we get into the the, the fun times, the home stretch down the down the stretch of the season here. But I do want to make sure we brought them up because they both had huge weekends and they both lost their big weekend. So I want to dust off the old panic meter. I'm going to bust it out here for both sports. We'll start with softball. They were down in Austin, you know, top five matchup, and they lost the series. Um, OU softball haven't lost a Big 12 series since 2011. Okay, it's been a – I, actually, Super they haven't they haven't lost a three game series ever. So that was since 2011. It's like like they anytime the Big Twelve has been in a three game series situation, they have never lost it. What happened in 2011? Was it not three games? No, it wasn't. Yeah, they, they, expanded they, to, they, they expanded it. The yeah, they changed the format to uh, three game series. So yeah. it had they had it had never happened basically in this in like in this conference. So they were one year away of like being able to say we never lost <laughs> a conference. You know, Either way, conference first time series, Texas so. beat them in a series since '09. I mean, it's been yeah. it's been an outrageous long time. Now, okay, so this is going to be. A, I'm going to sound like I'm talking both sides of my mouth. They're allowed to lose a series. Okay, <laughs> the, the the stretch is 
absurd, uh, obviously, Canada, yeah. Yeah. Um, to go that long without losing a conference series. It's it's you can't even fathom it. It's so ridiculous. Thirteen years. But the other the other side of the the coin here is you always kind of felt like how is that team not going to win a national title because nobody can ever beat them two out of three it never happens and and to mm-hmm. to not win a national title you have to find a way to beat OU twice it's not basketball it's not March Madness it's not football obviously we it's one and done mm-hmm. in baseball and, and softball it's double elimination so it's always felt like it's impossible you might get them once but you're never going to get them twice Texas just got them twice they just showed it's possible. James, you were watching these games. You covered them for us on Sooners mm-hmm. Illustrated. Again, I'll ask again. Panic meter. How yep. should OU softball fans be that, oh, my gosh, like this stretch of dominance that we've been on, it might kind of be over. Now they're still 39-3 and three or whatever they are. They're still great. Yeah, are I mean, they the most beatable that they've been in however long? Yeah, well, the la- yes. The, for the final question, yes, they are a little bit more beatable than they've you know, been over the last couple of years. That's obvious now with the three losses because it hasn't been that way in quite some time. But watching this series, OU just could never string the hits together they needed. Usually, like, OU gets somebody on base, and even if it's two outs, the next batter up will hit a home run or something like that. It'll, it'll be a spark plug, and the whole team just goes from that. Like, they, they just – it all kind of storm balls downhill, and it just never happened in this one. Kenzie Hansen will get on and hit, hit a ball, and Riley Boone, who's right after her, is, is you know, the spark plug of the team. It's like those those two together usually make something happen, and it just wouldn't happen in this because either Maya Bland gets thrown out at home on the last play of the game after Riley Boone hits the ball that deep in the field. It's like there was there was always something with this team, and only scoring two runs in those last two games. I mean, it's just it's it's that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what team you are; that's just not going to work. I mean, but outside of that home run with Jada Coleman in the first game that gave him you know the five runs or whatever, they they didn't do a lot. You know, just stringing hits together it didn't it didn't really happen this time around and that was the most worrisome thing because usually this team is unstoppable in that sense they just they can find a spark and find their own motivation and keep on going and they just didn't do it here and that i mean that was the that was the biggest takeaway you talked about the numbers i mean this this the series streak they also lost their 40 game win streak in the big 12 like they had won 40 consecutive games against big 12 opponents in the regular season i mean they they we talked about their 71 win streak overall. They had a 17 game win streak here. The numbers were just flipped, basically. The 17 game win streak that was the most in college softball this season, and that was gone. And so all these streaks are getting broke here because of mm-hmm. what just happened. Which it just kind of goes back to how dominant this team has been. Because you look at those numbers, like that shouldn't even happen anyway. So it, I mean, it just had to happen at some point, I guess. Yeah, and I think Oklahoma fans will. Be the first to admit that they're kind of spoiled by how oh, yeah, kind of, yeah. and dominant yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this team yeah, has been. Yeah. Um, so c- certainly, there's going to be some some level of panic, so to speak. But I don't think the sky is falling by any means. I do think this team is more vulnerable than it has been in years past. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, may, it has some areas that it needs to work on. And look, it's a long season. There's still plenty of time left. But I mean, I think the bigger question going into the season was more about the pitching. But now the concern seems to be a little bit more about the hitting, like James was talking about. Like you, mm-hmm. you can't go back to back games scoring just one run and expect to win a series. Well, I, guess they're not by they, team. Yeah. I mean, they, they were one for nine with with runners in scoring position in those last two games. I mean, that's just it's yeah, it's good, not, yeah, it's not going to cut it. And, and and it's a it's a team that you know during this dominant run has been so explosive at the plate. It's been so dominant in the pitching circle. You know, there's going to be times where one or both of those isn't happening and you know you just have to hope that it doesn't happen you know twice in a three game span like you were saying like you mm-hmm. you need you you can't af- you can afford losing a series during the season but once the postseason gets long you need you can't you can't slip up like that and these guys know that mm-hmm. you know that they've they've been through this patty gasso has been you know been so success so successful with this program she knows what it takes to win um a lot of these players do too and you know like I said, I don't think the sky is falling. Um, I think it might have been a little bit more of a wake up call than anything. That hey, you know, this team is not invincible. Um, they have yeah. some weaknesses that they mm-hmm. need to address and try to figure out as they get deeper in the season. And I think that's going to make things a lot more interesting this year because it's already you know uncanny going after four straight titles, which nobody's ever done in college softball. But now you see like, okay, it's not just like inevitable. There, there could be some things like as, as Josh said. I mean, Texas showed it. I mean, they can't be beat twice, and so that's that's going to be the fun part about this season. I think 
is can they solve the problems? Can they get everything together and finish? And and one more streak to add before we get to baseball that doesn't mean anything. The streak makes means no that makes no difference. But OU softball won't have a player of the week this week. I mean, honestly, it's just not going to happen. They've they've had that for uh, over the entire season. They've had at least one player. Sometimes they had two, but one player. So, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, no. Yeah. There's a lot of shocking aspects to it. Like you guys said, I mean, the lack of offense is insane. I mean, we talked about. I mean, over the years, I mean, quite literally, OU not only do they obviously win almost every game, but they they more often than not by a large majority run rule. Obviously, if you're going to run rule teams, you have to score yeah. at least eight, nine, ten runs. Yeah. And not being able to score hardly at all was was stunning. And then the 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 Saturday night game, you know, the the runner leaves early, and Patty Gasso challenges it, and they wipe out those two runs. After a moment like that, and you think that's the like foregone exactly. conclusion that they're yes, going to win. Yeah. Now. You like think that's, that's what's going to always do. And they didn't, obviously. Yeah. And then the other part of that is that after they lost, and Patty Gasso said as much in a post game, I saw like some quotes that, uh, that people put up that they're going to bounce back. And they, they, uh, there's another thing they always do. I mean, after a wake up call like that, they come back. I mean, I think probably a large percentage of the OU fan base probably thought going into Sunday. I bet they run rule them today, and they yeah, and then yeah. they didn't. It was more of the same. They scored one run again. So again, they're still great. It's not like they're bad. That'd mm-hmm. be very silly to say. <laughs> they're, they're I think like number two now, softball America poll. Like mm-hmm. they're still great. They're still one of the best teams, and they still could very easily win a national title. But again, the overarching theme: they're clearly more vulnerable and beatable than they've been, which is still very good. But they were basically invincible before, and they're not quite that now. Mm-hmm. And we'll keep an eye on it. Gonna be a fun rest of the season. Like I said, and we're all over it. it. It's illustrated, obviously. The change of, of the rules as well kind of played a factor in that too because it when was I talked ago, about yeah, yeah right. the Maya Bland going home, that last year that would have been an obstruction call and OU would have scored there. And so they yeah. would have had the chance to, to win that game. But it's just it just the rules just change. So shifting over to baseball. Um I was in Stillwater over the weekend, Bedlam baseball, over eight stadium, which is a palace. It's a, a amazing venue for, for college baseball. It's been a bit of a house of horrors for OU. Um, hasn't gone well there a lot, but I was out there in Stillwater. I'll get, I'll, I'll get the panic meter back out. And, uh, am I smashing the panic button for, for OU baseball? Um, this is complicated. This is tough because yes and no, uh, I'm going to cheat. Um, they're still in first place in the Big 12. Okay, let me start with that. They're tied for first place in the Big 12. Um, I know it hasn't been pretty the last few weeks, and it hasn't. They're on a skid right now. I think they've lost 8 of 12. Um, it hasn't been great the last few weeks. But they're still tied for first place in the Big 12. They're still hitting at an elite level. This is a great offense. Right now, the pitching is is puzzlingly it, – it's struggling a lot, and it's struggling in walking, guys, which you would think – I mean, I asked Skip Johnson this directly after the after the game yesterday, like, does it make it easier to talk to your pitchers when it's like in the it, yesterday in, on in the Sunday game they gave up seven or they have six runs in the seventh and there were six walks in that inning. Mm. It's not like they're getting clobbered. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of home runs. The ball was flying this weekend, but that inning was a lot of self inflicted. I mean, you got to throw strikes, you know. I mean, so Oklahoma they got a good team. They have a lot of talented pitchers. Um, the offense is fantastic. They're going to get John Spikerman there their best player. He's going to be back soon. He's been out throughout this this losing stretch. He's been out with that hand injury. He's going to be back soon. I'm not smashing the panic button yet. You know, they're still in good shape for the postseason, all that stuff. They're tied for first place literally in the Big 12, right? So they're still in good shape. But they clearly have got to figure out some things in the bullpen right now. Um, the bullpen has cost them a couple of games. Um, the first game on Friday, going back to the Lamar series, the, the bullpen had some rough go. So – Again, they're scoring at a high level. There's a few pitchers who are pitching really well. They just kind of kind of find it. It's the same team that went into Fort Worth and swept TCU a few weeks ago. Like we know it's in there, but it was a it was tough, and especially because going yesterday they were leading five three in the seventh. They were close to a huge series win on the road, and then that seventh was just a nightmare. I mean, with the walks and just you know, they just couldn't get out of it. Just felt like it was never going to end. One of those types of innings. So I'm not smashing the panic button yet. The concern level is reasonable. I think most fans will have some concern level, but they're still in good shape. There's still a long way to go. Um, there's still a lot of talent on the team, and they're going to get John Spikerman back. So that's kind of where I'm at. Like, yes, concern is fair, but it, there's still reasons to be excited about what they can do moving forward. So we'll keep an eye on that. I don't know if you guys and this is this is what's so interesting about you know the diamond sports. I mean, 
as you just said, with softball and baseball, I mean, there's still time to figure everything out. Like when mm-hmm. it happens in football, I guess with the way the schedule used to be, like, you know, only losing one or two games a year and you can't really do anything. But it was like you can really full on panic with football. Like in, yeah, in, right. in, in the Diamonds where it's like, OK, yeah. let's just see yeah. if they can, you know, fix some things and they'll be all right because they still have the tournament play and you still got to beat them twice. I mean, so it's just, you know. Right. I mean, that's what I can put. I went and looked, you know, last year. Um, last year, after 31 games, Oklahoma was 16 and 15, and they didn't have that yeah, so it's, baseball it's record. Way better, yeah. This year, they're 17 and 14, and they have a better yeah. baseball record. They're in first place. They're tied first place. So they're in a better shape they were than last year. Last year, obviously, they made the tournament. And I would say this year's team overall is a better team. So, mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, concern is fair, and that was a tough weekend, tough way for it to end, but they're still in good shape. And uh, big week coming up. Kansas State comes to Norman next weekend. Obviously, former OU coach Pete Hughes is the coach over there at Kansas State. Um, he's always greeted very warmly when he comes back to Norman. Not really. Um, and that's a big series. Kansas State's right on OU's heels in that Big 12 race. They're like a game below him, I think. So that's a big series coming up. Big chance. If you only two or three at home next weekend against Kansas State this coming weekend, you're right back on track, I feel like. So big, big week. Big week coming up. All right, I think that's it. Good show. We covered four sports. We're nothing if not versatile. Um, <laughs> we'll be back later this week. Uh, Colin jump aboard. We didn't really get into uh, Marcus Wimberly, who committed over the weekend. Kind of came a little bit out of nowhere. I mean, it's a guy we talked about before, Colin and I. Uh, but we'll get more into that on the Thursday show. I want to save that for him, just kind of how it came together so kind of suddenly. Because he didn't he didn't do all this like, I'm committing on this day, and then boom, he did it. It just kind of yeah. happened. So well, I want to get into that more with him on the Thursday show. Uh, also, a couple more commitments coming up later this week. We talked about that. Uh, we previewed it. Trent Wilson uh, a couple of this week, along with Malik Hawkins, Michael Hawkins' younger brother. They're both committing on Wednesday. And so we'll recap all that with Colin on the Thursday show. Three of us will be back next week uh, to preview the start of, um, the, on next Monday to preview the spring game, our final thoughts of spring camp and what we're watching for and all that good stuff. Anything else happens in the basketball transfer portal and everything else. So we'll see you then. Great show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe to Sooners Illustrated. Subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. For Tom Green, James E. Jackson, I'm Josh Calloway. We'll see you guys next time right back here on the Sooners Illustrated podcast. See you.